everybody. Welcome to our webinar inside the designer studio. I'm Lori Roop and I am the director of design for CF Stinson and I'm coming to you live from our beautiful studio in Kennebunk, Maine. And we cleverly know how to co-host this thing. So I'm going to let our senior designer introduce herself. Hello. Um... My name is Lauren Kidwell, and like many of you, I'm working from home right now. So um, you're seeing my uh, spare bedroom slash studio office. Um, my heart is with Lori and Kenny Bunk, and um, I'm really glad you could join us today. Great. We have a lot of things that we want to share with you today. Um, just want to say first that CF Stinson is a third generation textile company that is based in Rochester Hills, Michigan. And so when you call Stinson, you're usually talking to um, customer service would be out in Rochester Hills. So it's sampling in our warehouse and all our management team. The reason our design studio is in Kennebunk is because I freelanced for Stinson for quite a few years before um, tackling the director of design position. And my studio was in Kennebunk, Maine. So when they asked if I wanted to become director of design, I said, I would love to, but I don't want to move to Michigan. So they were very kindly let us set up a studio here and hire Lauren and we're very happy to be here and have a great quality of life. So to start off today, we wanted to kind of show you um, a little bit of Maine and our um, studio space. We wanted to share a little bit of our families. Um, so we're gonna show you a video, quick video, and you'll see Lauren's cute um, toddler kids and my less cute teenager kids. You'll see our studio dogs, um, Ruby and Fern. If you follow us on Instagram, I'm sure you know who Fern is. Um, and just a little bit of our process and just to kind of show you the environs here, we're about 10 minutes from the beach. And our studio is located in a, an old factory building, which sits um, on a river, like a lot of factory buildings in Maine. And there's actually a waterfall, which you'll see, which is generating um, power for the town. I'm gonna share my screen with you. just a little pump up jams um, and we have a lot of material that we want to cover but, but first I just wanted to mention that if you look at the bottom of your zoom screen and maybe jiggle your mouse a little bit you'll see some options we're gonna answer questions at the end in the Q&A portion so please feel free to um, type in any textile related questions or anything at all really like Lori, is your sweater really that sparkly? And we will answer, no, it's not. It's the lighting. Um, so we're happy to answer anything today. And we would love to have a dialogue with you all in the conversation. So I'm going, we, we thought we would start out with um, just a little bit of um, the evolution of the loom, basically a quick history lesson, because Lauren and I love to love weaving 
um, we both went to Rhode Island School of Design, um, where we had to learn all kinds of textile fun stuff like fibers and dyeing, spinning, um, weaving, of course, printmaking, also knitting. Um, so we're really technical and we like that sort of thing. So if you um, geek out with us for a few minutes, we're just going to do a quick little PowerPoint on the evolution of the loom. There we go. Okay, so here we have the simplest of simple looms. This is just um, a simple table loom or a frame loom. And I show you this picture because it is so simple. And you can see if you walk away with any knowledge today, hopefully you will remember that these vertical yarns here are called the warp. And the yarn, the colorful yarn that they're putting across here is called the weft or the filling. So those are two tech, textile terms that um, if you throw them around, you seem really smart. So as you can see, um, you can't weave very much on a loom like this, probably just um, a pot holder size, basically. So if you want to weave something larger, you really need to have um, a hand loom. So this craftsy lady here is setting up her hand. Um, if you look at the blue threads, those are the warp threads. And if you go to the back of the loom, you can see she's got lots of them rolled onto this back beam. And that's what's allowing you to have full yardage. So they come through the loom. They go through um, these shafts here, which are going to raise and lower the warp threads. They come through here, and this is where she's going to do her work. She's going to put her filling yarn onto this little wooden shuttle and she's going to keep throwing it across um, the warp yarns in different combinations of raising and lowering the warp yarns and that's where the weaving is going to happen and then it's going to go down and she's going to roll it onto this beam down here. The loom is controlled by these foot pedals here like an organ and when you press down on those you're going to start raising these shafts here which are controlling the warp. So this is a industrial version of that loom. It's called the Dobby loom. And I think it illustrates some of the types of weaving that you can do on these types of loom, looms. Um, as you can see, the warp ends are grouped together here. And all you're really getting is kind of this basket weave texture type of thing. On these types of looms, that's really, um, you can't do very many fancy things. So you can do textures, um, you can do these types of structures. This is actually a Rhode Island School of Design student work. You can see that um, the loom is basically controlling groups of warp threads. So you're getting this large structure. And here are some other examples of types of weaves that you can do on that kind of simple Dobby loom. Um, you know, like herring bones, stripes, bird's eye twill, that sort of thing. And this is, um, this is called a peg chain, and this can help kind of quicken the work for you if you're working on a hand loom. This can actually instruct the loom on which warp ends to raise, and it kind of works like a music box where the pegs that you've put in are instructing the loom to raise the warp ends. So if you want to do something more complicated, you actually have to use a jacquard loom. And the jacquard loom was a huge invention um, from 1805 by Joseph Maurice Jacquard. And the amazing thing about the Jacquard loom is that you don't control, you don't have to control just chunks of warp threads anymore. You can actually control individual warp threads. And that's what allows you to be able to draw, you know, florals or geometrics or that kind of thing. So that's the amazing um, invention, um, the Jacquard loom. So um, this here, these are punch cards, which are actually um, instructing the jacquard loom, an early jacquard loom, as to which warp ends to raise. So the, the warp ends are either raised or not, and those dots, you know, there's either a miss or there's, there's a blank there. So it's a very simple concept, um, but it's controlling the whole jacquard loom. And fun fact, um, those jacquard punch cards actually were seen by early computer designers. And this is an early IBM punch card. You can see it's very similar. Um, and it was helping to instruct the early computers. So weaving's had some big influence on our lives. Um, here we have an early jacquard loom. 
And this is Joseph Marie Jacquard and his friendly assistant. And if you look to the right, you can see above her head those um, Jacquard punch cards, which are going into the loom. And kind of all the brains of the loom are up here. This is an early Jacquard head. And it's instructing all the cords down here as to which warp ends to raise. Here's modern day Jacquard looms. I think there's six here in the picture. So you have um, two Jacquard looms that are facing each other and you can see there's a little pathway in between. So one weaver can actually oversee the weaving of two looms at the same time. And so there's a downstairs where the loom is and then upstairs on the second level, this is where the Jacquard heads are housed. And while we don't use punch cards anymore, um, we actually send the data on discs and such. Um, that information still goes upstairs into that Jacquard head and is instructing those yellow cords to pull up um, certain warp ends. And here's a close up of our fabric hexi that's weaving on a current day Jacquard loom. Um, right here in North America. And I like this picture because Hexi actually uses black and white warp ends in the same fabric. And you can clearly see right along here as the fabric is growing and being made, you can see where the black ends are raising for certain parts of the design and where the white ends are raising for the other parts of the design. Okay, so that's a little weaving 101. And next, I'm going to pass it over to Lauren for more process. Hi. So um, we're going to dive into how we approach textile development. And at the start of every collection, um, Lori and I create color boards. And the way we gather material for these color boards is pretty much everywhere, from magazines to postcards from galleries or museums that we've been to. And we um, start grouping them and through kind of looking through them and grouping them by color the trends start to reveal themselves um, and I'll show you some of these boards so here's the neutral board and you can see here it's ranging from you know cool grays to um, more colorful warmer neutrals and um, we're really noticing a trend now neutrals warming up um, and then our fresh, bright yellow board, which um, is like little bolts of sunshine, um, and combining different kind of surprise colors with yellow and neutrals. And our blue board, and here we're tackling all different kinds of blues from classic navies to really clean, fresh cobalt blues to beautiful teals. And our red jewel tone board, which um, goes from a more classic red to more nuanced red tones like terracotta and um, brick colors. Um, so um, those are our color boards. And I'll quickly run you through kind of the textile process. So this is artwork that we created for our design modernists. And the concept behind the design was just to do an, a gigantic geometric, just super large scale. And you can see the artwork is done with watercolors. And we loved the way the watercolors allowed us to blend color. And we really wanted that to be able to translate into the fabric. So um, we um, brought this design into the computer. And this is the artwork that was on the computer. It's not quite as beautiful or exciting, but um, when we communicate with Mills, this is what we will send them. And each color or shade in this design rep is, um, represents a different weave construction or yarn or yarn blending that's happening on the face of the fabric. So you can kind of imagine a paint by number situation where um, every block is representing a different weave or yarn. And then from there, we start getting trials. And once the trials look good, we move into color work, um, which then relates back to our color boards. So, most of the mills that we work with have set palettes of color. And um, these are some of the yarns that go into that fabric modernist. And you can see it's a whole rainbow of colors. And it's how we combine the colors 
that create the different colorways. And it really helps us to refer back to these color boards to kind of keep, to basically keep us focused, but also keep moving the colors that we, we are requesting forward. And um, so we're remaining kind of on trend or have fresh new colorways. And then here is the color line of modernist. And it really is nice to see how it relates to the, to the yarn, to the boards that we previously created. So here's our neutral and you can see how it's a blend of warm and cool tones. And then our fresh yellow and our blues, it was really hard for us to choose just one blue. So we chose, um, we have three. So our more classic, rich navy color, this beautiful teal, and then a blue green. I've always loved that one, Lauren, because it looks like your original artwork. It looks like your painting. Oh, yeah. See that? Look at that. Mm -hmm. <laughs> And then the, our red board, so, um, you know, classic red to me kind of um, made a little more modern with the combination of the, the light, the warm and cool neutrals, this beautiful jewel tone just goes from kind of like a deep burgundy type color to this beautiful orangey uh, color, and then we had to do a pink. So um, that's a quick little run through of how we develop modernness. Back to Lori at the studio. Thanks, Lauren. Um, so people ask us a lot how we get ideas for collections and how it all starts. And I think Lauren just did a great job showing how one way that we start collections, kind of looking through the zeitgeist and, and figuring out kind of what the, what's in the air right now. Um, so I wanted to walk you through um, the development of two special fabrics that were actually developed in conjunction with each other and kind of grew out of each other. Um, and they're part of a collection called Highline. And this is a case where um, we set out to design Highline with a theme. And so the theme is really to celebrate different textile techniques. Um, both Lauren and I have a eerily similar background. Um, besides both going to RISD, we also both worked at a very high-end um, residential firm in New York City um, that's really well known for their um, like amazing textiles for residential interiors. And so um, when we worked there, we got to work on all kinds of crazy constructions like embroideries and clipped shears and draperies and fancy velvets and things. Um, and something that we've learned is that it's, it's, it's not that hard to make silk and linen look really, really beautiful, um, but it's actually a lot more challenging um, to design um, high performance textiles like we do at Stimson um, because you can't work with um, fibers like linen or silk. They just don't pant, they don't hold up to the durability standards that we need. And so we're usually working with things like solution dyed nylon and polyester, um, which are about as sexy as they sound. So um, it really takes um, a lot of um, skill and technical prowess to sort of get the most out of those fibers and makes a really beautiful cloth. And so for Highline, we kind of set out to explore different textile techniques and really bring a tour de force of these techniques um, into like a high design aesthetic for Stinson, which is where um, we see Stinson moving in the future, um, is you know, still doing all the great products that we work on now, but also having this kind of high line of um, aspirational textiles that maybe would even um, inspire an interior. So I'm just gonna walk you quickly through the high line fabrics as a setup to um, the two I wanna talk about. So this is Boomerang and if you look very closely, um, you can see that this uses kind of a special cell weave um, along with that pretty large ge geometric um, juxtaposition. And this pattern is called Shuffle. And it's a beautiful kind of mammoth texture 
um, which actually is woven on the same type of loom and uses a cotton polyester, which is super soft and it feels as luscious as it looks. Um, this is offset, which is really kind of a wild, um, wild color interpretation. This pattern is called Multiply, and Lauren's going to talk more about this beautiful pattern. This guy is called Cordy. So from a distance, it's basically a, a cool geometric with triangles, but up close, um, this pattern is actually inspired by this beautiful cord yarn here, which doesn't look that great on the screen, but um, the cord yarn has a tough core interior and it's wrapped with um, a shiny or silky type of thread um, that binds it all together. And so we really wanted to highlight that for that fabric. This is called Mod Exploration of um, Simple Hexagon Shapes. And that brings us to the two fabrics in Highline I wanted to walk you through. This guy, Hexi, which you saw earlier on the loom which is we set out to do something that had high saturation of color, uses geometry, and also has a very kind of precise and pristine graphic. So that's Hexi. And then at the same time that was being developed, we also developed this pattern called Stuff, which is an embroidery. So first I'm gonna show you the early sketches. Also, not very glamorous. Um, so it's just simple pencil sketches exploring um, hexagon shapes and kind of connecting the outer points of the hexagon shapes in different ways. So working through some ideas there. And then the next version of Hexi is right here. Um, oftentimes it's easier to work on um, geometric designs on the computer because the precision is much better. <laughs> so um, this is when we took it from here right into the computer. So you can see that we're using the hexagon um, structure here and then starting to divide it up with color in different ways. This, this is another version you can see trying to break it up even more, getting a little closer to something that looks nice. And then here's the final, the final artwork that we sent to the mill. You can see it's very um, precision oriented. And then here's, here is it weaving and here is one of the early samples of Hexi. So while Hexi was being developed, we were really looking into um, doing an embroidery. So um, usually embroideries are more for residential interiors because they don't use very um, strong materials. But we were able to find an embroidery source in North Carolina that actually uses nylon as the embroidery thread. So we started working with them. This was an early design that we were working on. It's our um, pattern outlander in the background. It's the base cloth. And then you can see here there are different stitches. They're kind of showing us what their stitching can do. So there's thick ones and thin ones. And that's just a simple cloth. Um, and so we, we worked on this direction for a while. And then Lauren said, oh, you know, the structure of Hexi would actually be a really good stitch pattern. And so this is us trying to work through that. And there were many, many versions of this because what we discovered is that embroidery is priced by the number of stitches because the number of stitches determines how long it takes the embroidery machinery to work. So time is money, basically. So we actually had to keep redesigning the simple graphic to distill it down into the least amount of stitches. And so this is the final fabric stitched here. I'm sorry, stuff. Um, and you can see the simple stitching here. This is our ground cloth sprint. And this mill also does um, this kind of quilting technique where they add this heavy backing or batting and it makes you have this kind of full dimensional quilted technique. So that's an example of kind of working on two things in conjunction um, and getting some exciting results. So back to Lauren in Portland. So as Lori mentioned, I'm gonna get into the development of our fabric multiply. So this is the original artwork that was created for Multiply and 
you can see here, I basically took out a ruler and a pencil and construction paper and started playing with um, puzzling these pieces together until we got to um, a composition that we were really excited about and we liked. And then from here, again, we bring it into the computer. And I want to say that um, we use the computer as a tool, as I'm sure you do in your work. And it in no way creates the pattern or the repeat or the textile for us. We're telling it everything we want it to do. So um, uh, one of, I think one of the challenges of being a textile designer or a pattern designer is being able to put something into a good repeat. And that's basically um, what, um, when your eye can move over a pattern and doesn't get caught on one area or have any repeat marks or tracking lines that are um, kind of distracting. So um, this is what we did here with Multiply. I brought it into the computer and then I figured out how the filling yarns were going to stripe. And um, we scaled it up and then this is what we sent to the mill. Um, and then once we sent it to the mill with instructions on the weaves that we would like to use in the yarns, um, we get a first trial back. And this is um, a large piece of multiply. This is actually the first trial that we received. And it looked gorgeous. We were so excited. Um, it was really beautiful. And you can maybe see a little better on the back here how the fillings were striped to create that super multicolor effect on the face. Um, but um, don't be fooled. The process is not over here um, because Stinson is a performance textile company. Um, we go through rigorous testing once we get to uh, a point that we like with the fabric. So um, oftentimes, the fabric doesn't um, meet the criteria that it needs to, whether, and then we'll have to adjust the weaves or the yarns used before we can move forward with development. So the whole process of a fabric from the initial conception of the idea to when you're able to actually order samples is usually a year, but sometimes the process can be a lot longer. Um, we have some textiles in our line that have taken up to six years to introduce um, because of various reasons, mostly with testing. And um, Lori and I cry a little tear because it's so frustrating, but we get there and it's worth it because um, that's what we have to do. So um, I'll show you the color line of Multiply. Um, this one was really fun to color because there's so many colors in it. So um, our peachy pink, which I love, orange, super snappy black and white, kind of more moody, dark neutral, um, kind of our ocean blue, our snappy navy, our green with that pop of surprise, kind of neon green, and then my personal favorite is the multicolor, which I showed you the big piece of. Um, so not all of our artworks, as Lori showed you with Hexi, are these super laborious, um, carefully considered artworks. And um, oftentimes they are little sketches and the ideas come to us at really informal moments. Um, so this is the artwork for our design full turn. And um, it was done with a whiteout pen on this really textured black paper. And basically what happened was the whiteout created these beautiful like little craggly edges that were um, a surprise. And we loved the way that looked. So um, once again, we took this into the computer and we carefully put it into a repeat and we decided to really scale up the design. And what I love about it is, even though the motif got really, really big, um, because it's made up of all these little tiny marks, it really is more of a pattern plane and it's not as commanding as you would think um, because of the scale. And then this is our fabric full turn. And this is in a solution dyed nylon. And um, even though it's solution dyed nylon, the weaves have a really nice texture and we were able to um, maintain those interesting little um, craggly edges along the edge of the motifs. I'll quickly show you the color line. And here she is. Got some beautiful kind of 
blue and white and kind of more vibrant tones. So that is full turn. Back to Lori. <laughs> Um, so, so far we've shown you a lot of woven product development. So we thought it would be fun for the last one that we go through um, to show you a coated fabric development because we do a fair amount of that as well. Um, so this is our pattern that's called frequency and I'll take it in a little closer so you can see. The start of frequency actually came um, from the mill. Because Lauren and I are both really technical, the mills often come to us with new techniques that they're working on so that we can kind of um, finish them off together and see where what direction we might be able to take with them um, and collaborate. So basically for frequency, the new technique was this kind of soft focus striping in the background. So if you imagine like um, watercolor paper with a wet wash on it and then taking a blue watercolor stripe across and then taking a yellow watercolor stripe across, eventually through osmosis they might meet in the middle and form kind of a green color. So that's not exactly how they do this because it's top secret and I can't actually tell you how they do it, but um, you can see that it makes really a beautiful effect. So. We worked on that and we decided that we wanted to do an overprint on top of these very fine lines in that coffee color. So I'm gonna show you the artworks for frequency. This is a printed vinyl, in case that wasn't apparent. Um, here's an early artwork where you can see a little bit, the background is shading from kind of a bluish slate to a copper color to a yellow and it's kind of implying that blending and then um, there's kind of this overprint of sort of dramatic um, zebra stripes offset. So this was the first direction that we were going in. And so in order to get, um, like we, we like to maintain the hand-drawn look if that's what we were going for. So um, to get it into the computer, we kind of want to start with something hand-drawn. And so here I was working out the repeat a little bit and just doing the outline of the shapes first. And then I was going to fill those in and scan it into the computer. But um, when I started filling in the shapes, I was like, oh, wait, hold up. I don't think I like that as much as I actually like this. And I kind of got attached to the fine outline and thought that it was rather sophisticated. So we changed direction and decided that that was the direction we wanted to go in and to use those fine, sophisticated lines. So we worked on the, the repeat in the computer for a while and finally sent something off to the mill. And based on our file, this is what they sent back. So this is a paper printout that is like a checks and balance system where we can take a look at the repeat and decide if we think it's looking good. So it was looking good. And the next step, was a full width print on vinyl of the pattern. And so again, we spend a lot of time checking repeats, making sure there isn't a dark blob somewhere or a light blob that's really detracting your eye, but we have like a nice all over kind of effect. So um, we already knew that this quality was gonna test well. So then we were ready to start working on color work. And just to show you um, the level of insanity that Lauren and I have, this whole file is full of early color developments. Um, where basically we tried every combination <laughs> that we could think of to see what was going to look best for frequency. And as you can see, we had some bad ideas, fine, and we had some good ideas. <laughs> so we narrowed this down with the whole Stinson team and decide which ones we want to move forward with and ask um, the mill for samples of. And you don't want to ask for too many because you actually have to pick out Pantone chips for every color. Um, and you don't want to be picking out 100 Pantone chips. So here are some of the ones that we specified with the mill. So you can see this blue and this kind of taupe color. Those are the background washi colors. And then this is the overprint color here. So we have some neutrals some kind of sunshiny warms and then here you can see um, this guy um, actually turned into one of our final colors so you can see here the two background print, print colors and then this is the overprint color on top and you can see it changes a little bit when it's in production.
And then I think this is interesting to see because this was an early coloration where we did the orange and the ruby in the background and we did an overprint of this khaki color and it looked like this and somewhere along the way we decided to change to this aubergine and you can see how very different that overprint um, affects the overall look so this was the final color and then the rest of the palette is fairly sophisticated um, for frequency pretty solid on terracotta color sort of zebra and this pretty warm, cool, neutral. So that's frequency. Um, and then we're all really disappointed that we're not gonna get to see you all at Neocon this year. Um, we have planned to introduce a new collection called Balance with Assure. So we thought it would be fun to at least show you a preview of the collection. Um, here's a case where the whole collection was born from our need to have more patterns in our line that were healthy or hospitals initiative compliant. And so we actually partnered with Sombrella, great company, um, to come up with a new um, stain repellent finish that is still healthier hospitals compliant. So normally if you want to be healthier hospitals compliant with a woven textile, you just don't put any stain repellent on it and that gets you in. But um, then you don't have a stain repellent. <laughs> so um, we actually were able to develop the chemistry with Sombrella um, to come up with this great stain repellent finish um, that is still compliant with that initiative. And it's a really great platform. It's also FAC Silver certified. It's Prop, Prop 65 compliant and REACH compliant, and it's Green Guard Gold certified. So um, it, it's really a great product. It's also bleach cleanable. Um, if you know Sombrella, you know it has a beautiful cottony hand. It's also indoor-outdoor and can be part of their um, sustainable take-back program. So we're really excited. Um, sorry, these are my little samples. I told you it was a preview, so it is. Um, <laughs> this is our pattern mantra. Um, the whole collection has a kind of um, biophilic design principle um, overriding everything and also kind of building on this wellness theme that's so important right now. So obviously, uh, you know, a flower motif is, is based on nature and also there's something very soothing to us about um, the symmetry that's found in nature. And so I think we played that out here. So that's pattern mantra. And here's a exciting color of mantra. And then this is a, I wish I had a bigger sample to show you, but this is our pattern Serene. Um, and it was inspired by a kind of a very soothing landscape with a kind of ombre of color, color happening in it. Um, so it's very kind of a soft geometric and it's a pretty large scale design. And we have a lot of exciting colors. I'm only showing you two. And here we have pattern Thrive. And if you look behind me, you can see Lauren's two really nice artworks here. And you can see some of the other colors that we introduced Thrive in. So there's a pretty pink and a fun orange. <clears throat> this is Pattern Bliss. Also kind of that soothing um, re repetition of geometry. And you can see there's some fun accent colors in here. Somewhat of a beautiful heathered background. Sorry, there's Bliss again. And then this is Pattern Season. And you can see it's a leaf motif. Um, and then we really played up kind of the texture of the veins and the leaves. So again, that symmetrical presentation. And then had some fun with the outline colors here. And if you look at the back, there's the fun, there's the party in the back. Um, that Season. And here's another color, a little more neutral with accent colors. And finally, we have Pattern Sync, which was inspired by nighttime constellations. So you can see there's kind of a neutral heathered background with these beautiful shades of blue and neutral stars, if you will. And then it can get very playful with a more multicolored look. All right, so that is Balance with Ashore, which is coming your way very soon. Um, so before we do question and answer, we just wanted to wrap up 
um, with another little video to share with you about some of the collections that we've talked about. Um, if you pay attention, you'll see even um, a quick picture of the Stinsons. I'll just play this for you real quick and then we'll do a Q&A. some Q&A. We hope you have some more questions. I see three. What do we got, Lauren? Okay. What are some of the more popular colors you've seen clients gravitating towards? Well, um, blue is always a very popular color and um, all shades of it. I think that it, it appeals to people on a lot of levels. I know it's my five-year-old son's favorite color. <laughs> <laughs> it's also, um, I think, soothing, and um, I don't know, Lori, you have anything you want to add? Um, I was looking at the next question, so I'm sure that... <laughs> <laughs> um, so, also, I looked it up, uh, Hexi... Oh, you already did. <laughs> is Hexi cost per yard, and it's uh, $62 a yard. And, and then, if, you, if you simply register on our website, then um, you can see all of the pricing. So I encourage you to do that. It takes maybe three minutes to register. Um, yeah, so $62 a yard. Um, that also oh, yeah. applies to the last question, which um, someone's asking about uh, fabric uh, samples. And um, if you register on our website, it's very, very easy to order samples. They come to you in a couple days and um, you can, they don't necessarily have to go to you. You can also direct them to one of your clients if that's easier. And um, you can just literally just click on whatever colorways or fabrics you want, put them in the cart and then have them sent. And um, I, being that Lori and I work remotely, we do that too. And it's, it's super easy. So um, again, just register and all that is accessible to you. Yeah, and also, or you could reach out to your salesperson and um, they'd be happy to help you with that. And if you don't know who your salesperson is, you could probably go um, to the customer service um, section of the website and just ask them who that is and we would love to put you in contact with them. Any other, any other questions? Anything at all, really? Any textile questions? Do you know what railroading is? Yeah, there you go. You know where our memos is. come from. <laughs> <laughs> no, oh, we got another question. <laughs> Do you see your textiles more in commercial or residential designs? Well, we want our textiles to go everywhere, um, but they are built to um, to withstand contract interiors, so education, healthcare, um, hospitality and contract interiors. So um, we think the aesthetic is um, across all those markets, but um, you know, uh, because we have a little bit of a residential background, maybe we have that aesthetic as well. Um, so yeah, we see them going 
everywhere, um, but they are built for contract interiors. And sorry, they're weed whacking right outside the window that I'm looking at. So <laughs> here, that's what it is. <laughs> it's real. It's <laughs> oh, more questions. Um, would you mind speaking to cleanability? I know this will be a big question with upcoming with the upcoming months. Sure. Um, we've added some new features to our website. Uh, where you can actually search, especially the coated fabrics, by certain um, cleaning um, and disinfecting products that are available. So we encourage you to kind of check that out on our website. Um, and yeah, I mean, we feel pretty well poised for the current situation because we design a lot of healthcare textiles. So a lot of our products are bleach cleanable already with a 10% or 20% bleach solution. Um, they'll hold up to that if you know you're you're doing the rinse afterwards and everything. Um, we have a lot of textiles that um, can be disinfected with a bleach solution, um, and yeah, I mean either um, yeah we have polyester products like that, um, solution dye nylon products. They're all bleach solution cleanable, and then a lot of our coated fabrics are also cleanable with these other um, disinfectants that are available on the market. So um, I think, what do you think, Lauren? Did I answer that? I think you did an excellent job ex answering that. Okay. We, yeah, we, again, we're, um, we're well poised for this because we are so big in the healthcare arena and a lot of our fabrics have um, finishes on them like Krypton, which make them very cleanable. And a lot of our fabrics are bleach clean, ble bleach solution cleanable. So, um, really depends on what your needs are. Mm -hmm. um, so how long does it take to come up with a pattern? That, um, it varies. I tend to um, get myself into uh, very detailed um, designs with how tie down points work with the fabric. You can kind of see behind Lori's shoulder, there's a triangular design and it's all made up of um, different tie down points. and literally every single one of those I put in by hand. So um, that took a really long time, maybe even weeks. And other designs come super quickly and very easily. And um, it just really depends on what the pattern is and kind of what our overall vision is for it. I'm just gonna bring it I don't know if you can that. see all that, but those are all, those are all drawn, drawn in. So, um, it's fun, it's very satisfying. Um, we're very detail oriented in what we do. I think that's why we were <laughs> drawn to textiles. Maybe it um, takes us longer than other people. <laughs> yes, it, it does take us longer than maybe <laughs> usual. Uh, what collection has been your favorite to design? So I'll let um, Lauren think of hers. I was already thinking about it. Um, I have to say my favorite collection was from a little while ago and it was called Funny Bone um, and it was when we um, decided to take an initiative and design some um, patterns for pediatric use in um, healthcare settings. And at the time, my kids were little and um, it was a really fun project to work on. I mean, we decided that we want to take the approach of um, distracting children in healthcare settings could be helpful for both the, chil the children and the parents and maybe even the healthcare professionals <laughs> um, to just kind of distract them from whatever kind of stress they were feeling um, at the time. And so um, there were a, quite a few patterns in the collection, Funny Bone. Um, one of them was a stripe where we put a joke in each of the stripes. And um, so I had to run those all by my children uh, <laughs> make sure that they thought they were funny or at least like mom jokes. Um, and then there was another pattern called I Spy where it's a very linear pattern, but there are um, like hidden pictures inside. So, um, you know, if, if a kid was getting wrapped up and kind of looking at that on the upholstered furniture, they could maybe find different things like an ice skate or a ring or just different fun stuff like that. Um, so there, there are other patterns in the collection, but it's really was near and dear to my heart because it took about five years to work on that whole collection. And um, kind of my kids grew up at the same time from like little littles to kind of fully formed adults, not adults, but like fully formed people, I guess. So um, it's always been close to my heart. 
How about you, Lauren? Um, it's hard to pick a favorite. It's like picking your favorite kid. But um, <laughs> I have to say one that I feel sentimental about is um, our ethereal collection because it was our first um, the first collection that Lori and I worked on is like a textile team. And um, I feel really proud of that. So that, I think that was, that was really fun. And that was my first collection with Stinson. But um, I, I, there, I feel proud of everything we put out. We've, <laughs> we've put a lot of work into it. I know, or we wouldn't do it, right? Um, Let's see. You can do the next one, Lauren. Okay. So you mentioned some patterns can take up to six years to develop. What would, with that said, do you have to adjust the colorways since the fa they phase out from time to time? Um, yes. And some, the, oftentimes uh, what's holding up the fabric from moving forward is the testing piece. And um, we don't move on till color work until that is locked down color work is the last part of the process. So um, the answer is yes, we will adjust the colors. And secondly is we um, often wait till close, as close to ordering before we get into all that because it's a lot of work for us to get into color blanketing. And it's also a lot of work for the mill because they're weaving all those trials for us. So we try to be respectful of that and not ask for too much. Do you have concern with the sanitizing treatment of using UV lights? Um, I can't really speak to that right at the moment. I don't want to give you any misinformation. Um, so we haven't done a ton of testing on that. Um, we don't know how widespread um, the UV light sanitization process is going to be, but um, I would think that our products that are indoor outdoor as well as bleach cleanable are are probably going to be the best bet for that but um i can't really give you any tests and data on that right now i wouldn't want to misspeak um, but it's definitely something that we're thinking about working on so thank you for asking the question okay do you try to stay within certain repeats when developing schemes and designs um well um a lot a big portion of what determines the repeat is the limitations of the loom. So oftentimes the most common repeat on a loom is 13 and a half inches. So we try to work within that, within the uh, setup of the looms and um, they can sometimes be half width, which is 27 inches wide and very seldomly you get full width designs. Um, those are more common for um, privacy curtains but less common for upholstery and full width is the full width of the fabric. So 54 inches and different um, techniques have different repeats. So for instance, um, a, a coated fabric that's digitally printed has a very different repeat limitation than a coated fabric that is a rotogravure, which is you're limited to the circumference of the roller that is printing it. So within those parameters, how we determine repeats is um, we look at the line and see like, for instance, with Modernist, we really wanted something really large scale for the line and for our collection. Um, we also print out different scales of a pattern and pin it up on furniture to see what feels the best for the pattern and what makes the most sense for it. So um, yeah, I think that yeah, just to add to that, that within a collection, if we're actually doing a collection, we do like to have a variety of scales in case someone wants to use them in the same space together. So you probably don't want all massive scale patterns in the same space. You might need a textural one, you might need mid scale, it's something huge. Um, so try to make it easy for you guys to work with. Oh, a compliment. Yes, dream job. Um, I agree. I have never. Um, regretted choosing textile design as a career. <laughs> it's, it's different every day and I love, I love what I do. I hope that's come across today. Um, were any of the patterns you showed, Lori, can be used for outdoor use? Absolutely. So um, this whole um, balance with the shore collection is indoor-outdoor. So all of the ones I showed at the end. And then also if you're on our website, 
um, you can search, there's a filter there for indoor outdoor fabrics. So you can also see what other things, these are just the newest. We have some other um, indoor outdoor designs on there. And here's the last one. So that's balanced with the sure. All right, what else do we have? How do you choose how many colorways are developed for each line? Um, well, we pick the color line for each, for each fabric. Um, we try to stay within a reasonable range. Um, we try to hit kind of the whole spectrum of colors within reason. Um, I'd say seven is usually a target number, but um, depending if it's a plane, um, we, go big because it's a plane and it's very usable. And, you know, for these more multicolor type designs, we kind of keep a tighter range of, you know, six, seven, eight, um, but it's not a strict formula. And oftentimes it's very hard to pick just one that we, <laughs> you know, for instance, one blue, it's very hard. So we pick a couple or, or you know, one neutral, you know, oftentimes we go with a lighter neutral or a darker neutral. So, um, it's it's loose parameters, but we try to be good editors. So, okay. do you have more organic patterns in the works for the future? Yeah, definitely. I mean, ranging from kind of um, just like softer geom geometrics, but also um, full on botanicals, as well as kind of hard to describe organics. Yeah, I mean that's something that we're very interested in. Certainly, ge geometry has been hot. Um, but we, you know, with all trends, if the pendulum is going this way, we think it'll probably go the other way. So yeah, we do have some organic patterns in work. Where are most of your, the mills you work with located? Well, I'm very proud to say that most of our mills are in America, so in the U.S. So um, I'd say our woven textiles, all the jacquards that you've been seeing are um, woven in the USA. And then depending on um, other qualities, it really um, gets more specific. And then we go to, um, you know, anywhere from South America to um, Europe. So there's a range, but I'd say a very large percentage of our line is in America, made in America. Who gets to pick the fabric names? Uh, well, we the studio makes suggestions and then our marketing department usually takes it and run with it. And it's always interesting to see where they run with it. Um, but we, we have some other people in Michigan who are part of the marketing team who come up with fabulous names and kind of take the theme that we are working on and, and build on it and come up with the pattern names. Okay, any favorite reads for fabric weaving technique, theory, or just for fun? Hmm, favorite reads, well, <laughs> I don't know, Lori, do, do you have a favorite source that you go to? Um, not really for technique, but certainly Pinterest is a, is a fun place to poke around and see what other people are doing and it can either just be kind of surface design or or it can be more technical and a bit more about the weaving um i i i don't really read too many textile ebooks but um it is always fun when there's like a textile reference in a book <laughs> it's like i get really excited and i tell my parents my children about it and they don't care um <laughs> but um no, I mean, I, if, if you have an interest in textiles, I would definitely encourage you to, to take some classes. And I mean, we, we love it. So um, the best part about it is to do the hands-on work of the thing. So um, yeah, we would encourage you to, to take some classes. Um, next question is, thank you. You're very welcome. We're happy to be able to do this right now. Um, both very informative and interesting. Oh, well, we're just so glad that um, people like Stinson and appreciate what we're doing. And um, thank you for taking the time to do this today. We know everyone's really busy and there's so many webinars out there that, um, you know, uh, we just are very um, flattered that people want to see us. So that's great. Yeah, we appreciate the time. The, um, um, there's one more question. Are you the only CF Stinson designers? Um, yes, it's just us two. And um, do you take 
ideas or inspiration from consumers. Um, well, we certainly work on a lot of custom projects. So anybody who can meet a certain minimum and has their own design idea, we would love to work on that. Um, and through your salesperson, basically. Um, and then once in a while, we work with um, an outside company. Like um, the last time we did that, we collaborated with Art of Board, um, which is a, a company that recycles skateboard decks and turns them into little wooden tiles. And we developed a textile collection with them um, based on some of, of their concepts. Um, but other than that, it's um, whatever comes out of Lauren and I's brain, basically. <laughs> Super, so thank you so much. Uh, you guys had a lot of great questions. I want, um, oh, there's more. Never forget the K through 12 palettes. Yes, thank you. We're always looking for branding colors. That's great. Yeah, um, that's great feedback. Yeah, um, again, like Lauren said, we want to thank you very much for um, giving us your time today. And um, yeah, it was, it was very fun for us to share our process and the studio with you. Yes, thank you and please everyone take good care. Thanks for uh, sticking with us today. <laughs> Bye. Bye.